Hello everyone, uh, my name is Mike Hennessy. I'm the manager of Buell Planetarium at Carnegie Science Center. Um, and it is my privilege to welcome you to a virtual edition of Cafe Sci uh, at Carnegie Science Center, uh, brought to you here on Facebook Live. Tonight's presentation is Lessons from the Universe. Uh, it's presented by PPG and sponsored by Cook My Site. And we are thrilled uh, to be joined um, by our speaker, Dr. Andrew Zentner, a professor at the Department of Physics and Astronomy and Pittsburgh Particle Physics, Astrophysics, and Cosmology Center at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, so, Andrew, welcome, and thank you for being part of our Cafe Sci tonight. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, we're going to be starting in just a few minutes, uh, letting folks get on board. Um, and while we do, uh, just a quick overview of how things are going to run tonight. Um, in just a few moments, um, I'm going to turn things over to uh, Dr. Andrew Zentner, uh, who's going to be talking about lessons from the universe. Um, and uh, Andrew, when your talk is done, um, we'll be taking some questions uh, afterwards. So uh, while Dr. Zentner's talking, feel free to type your questions into the comments, um, and then we'll go through and get to as many of them as we can uh, when we're done. All right, we'll give folks just a few more minutes to, to get on board. Um, and while we do, just a little teaser for uh, what we're talking about tonight. Tonight, we will explore the possibilities for dark matter, dark energy, the formation and evolution of black holes, and the very early stages of the universe we inhabit. We'll talk about how we can use the universe as a laboratory to study new laws of physics, learn about the history and science of the universe, and how the study of the universe can teach us valuable lessons. I'm here with Dr. Zentner himself. How did, how did I do? <laughs> perfect. That was perfect. All right. Those, those are your words. So, uh -huh. All right. Our speaker, um, you grew up in Queens, New York? I grew up in Queens, indeed, yeah. Um, you mentioned you started your uh, undergraduate degree at Cornell University and eventually transferred and got your bachelor's in electrical engineering uh, from the for the uh, Cooper Union for the Advancement of Science and Art in Manhattan. Uh, you also mentioned you were a bellhop in Midtown Manhattan. Before we get started, I wonder if you want to just share a little about that with our visitors. I was. I always tell people that was, I don't know. I should, I'm not sure if I should say this, but that was a great job. Maybe the best job I've ever had. Uh, it was a lot of fun, and it was very lucrative. <laughs> awesome. So, a great way to go through college. Very lucky to have that opportunity. Uh, folks who are just joining us now, we'll get started in, in just one minute. Uh, I'm here with Dr. Andrew Zentner from the University of Pittsburgh, the Department of Physics and Astronomy. Uh, he'll be speaking on lessons from the universe. Uh, Dr. Zentner got his PhD uh, in physics from the Ohio State University um, and was a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Chicago before joining the faculty at Pitt. Um, you also mentioned, I loved reading your bio, by the way, that you enjoy cooking, playing guitar, and you can never eat enough butter. Yes, butter is, I have a theorem that is famous at the department in Pittsburgh, which says that it is not possible to add butter to any food, and through doing that, make the food worse than it originally was. You can only make it better. <laughs> so basically, I put everything in butter. <laughs> So like science itself, <laughs> butter can just make things better all the time. <laughs> it makes things better. Mm -hmm. um, well, Andrew, what I'm going to do here is turn host privileges over to you um, in just a moment, and and we'll uh, we'll get started. I'm going to make sure that you've got a screen share here. Um, do you want to go ahead and do a, a quick test and make sure that you can screen share? Is it working? Perfect. Yeah, perfect. Looks like it's working for me. It's working for you guys. Are you seeing my slides? I am seeing your slides. Uh, so I think we're great, and I think you can uh, go ahead and take it away. Once again, everybody who just joined us, um, thanks for being here as part of our virtual Cafe Sci. Um, we're going to turn things over to uh, Andrew Zentner and Lessons from the Universe. So take it away. All right, great. Thank you for having me. Um, like you already mentioned, this is a bit unusual for me also. I haven't given one of these lectures in this kind of format before. Uh, so maybe you can bear with me a little bit. 
Um, but today what I'm going to talk about is about the history of our universe, what we know about the evolution of our universe, how we came to know that. Uh, and hopefully teach a variety of important lessons along the way about uh, both astronomy and science in general. And I'll also mention that, I don't know if anyone is looking at my face rather than the slides, but if you see me look up, it's just because I have a really big monitor up here, but my camera is down here. So it's easier for me to look up here. Um, so anyhow, I'll get started. Um, usually what I like to do is begin with the punchline that way, if you fall asleep in the middle somewhere, at least you got the end uh, conclusions. Um, I always start with this, but this joke falls flatter and flatter every year because I think fewer and fewer people know what cliff notes are anymore as the years go by. Uh, but you know, I tell people that I learned everything I know about literature from cliff notes. Uh, and so if I were to write cliff notes for the universe, uh, this is probably what they would say. They would begin by saying that the universe is 13.8 billion years old. Um, that number has about 100 million year uncertainty on it, which sounds like a, light, a lot, but it's actually only 1% of the measurement. So it's a very accurate, it's a very precise uh, measurement of the age of the universe. Um, so, you know, maybe it's 13.9, you know, for the purposes of this talk, that those numbers are all the same. Um, the other interesting thing about the universe is what we mean about the age of the universe. Really what we mean is that everything that we have experience with in the universe, planets, stars, galaxies, black holes, anything else that you might read about, all of that stuff didn't exist 13.8 billion years ago and has been evolving, has been forming, uh, and has formed and done whatever it does, it does as part of its life cycle in those last 13.8 billion years. The other part of this story that I think is amazing that doesn't always get as much attention as I think it should personally is that we know where all of the elements in the periodic table come from. So if anybody out there is a chemist or everybody's interested in chemistry or anybody even just knows about the periodic table, uh, it might seem like, well, there's just a bunch of elements out there. But one of the amazing things about cosmology, the science of cosmology, which is the study of the universe, is that we know where all the elements came from. And so the lightest elements in the periodic table, particularly hydrogen, helium, and lithium, they were formed actually in the first few minutes of the expansion of the universe. So if you wanna say it colloquially, you'd say you, they were formed during the Big Bang. And then all of the other elements were formed from the interior inside of stars in the evolution, during the evolution of stars. So the star will evolve, it'll blow up and it will spew out all the stuff that formed inside of it into the universe. And those will be recycled, make new stars and planets and so on. Um, and so part of what's happening here is that everything that we know about has a life cycle, including stars and galaxies, they'll all be born and die. Um, and that's sort of our picture of the universe. The two things that I'll end with, um, seeing, we'll see how much time we have. I always tend to digress and go over and all these kinds of things, but hopefully that will be fun. Uh, the two things that I tend to end with are the mysteries that we have in the universe. Um, because I think that these are the ways that the universe can probably teach us about new laws of physics. And those two mysteries are encapsulated in this last bullet point, the sixth bullet point, if you're looking at the screen right now. And what it says is that 4% of the universe is normal matter. So what I mean by that is protons, neutrons, electrons. So if I were to take a budget of all of the stuff in the universe, 4% of that would be the protons, the neutrons, and the electrons, and all of the elements and compounds that they form. Our best estimate is that roughly 22, 23% of the universe is in a form of something heavy, which doesn't interact with light. So for lack of any better word, we just call it dark matter. And finally, the rest of the universe, the remaining 74% is in some sort of form of energy called dark energy. Dark energy is something repulsive that sort of tends to cause the universe to, the acceleration of the universe to Cause, it tends to cause the expansion of the universe to accelerate, to get expand faster and faster as time goes by. So that's the Cliff's Notes. That's the short story. Um, the rest of the talk is basically, how did we know all of this stuff? Okay. And so now I'll go move on. Um, the first thing that I'd like to start with, and I won't spend too much time on this. Uh, for those of you that have gone to several of these talks before, this is probably a familiar concept to you. 
but I just want to make sure, depending on how broad the audience is, that we have some concept of the types of scales that we're talking about when we're talking about astronomical science, because it's very different from anything that you'd, you'd experience in everyday life. Um, and it's very important to separate sort of the minutia of things that happen on the scale of an individual planet <laughs> from the things that happen on the scale of a galaxy or the universe. Um, so the first thing is that distances are vast. And so we don't use conventional units to measure distance. We don't use feet or miles or meters or kilometers. The, all of those things would just be too inconvenient to work with. And so here is a, a diagram, not to scale, of the solar system, roughly showing the solar system, but also showing distances in the solar system in the conventional units that astronomers use. And that's what these labels are, six light hours and eight light minutes. So eight light minutes is a measurement of distance. It's how far light would go in eight minutes. Six light hours is a measurement of distance. It's the distance that light would travel if it were given six hours to travel. And so what you can see on this diagram is, for example, the Earth is eight light minutes away from the sun. So it takes eight minutes for the light from the sun to come to the Earth. And so what I always tell people is that one of the amazing and interesting things about that is when you see the sun set at night, it actually set eight minutes ago. It's just that that extra light that had been traveling since the sun set, it still took that last eight minutes to get to us before we actually saw the sunset. And so if you lived in, on Pluto, which is five and a half light hours away from the sun, you would wait five hours, the sun would set, but you'd, see, you'd keep seeing the light from the sun for five and a half hours before you actually see it set. Okay. And so that's the measurement, that's the distance scale, that's the way we measure distance in astronomy is how far, how long would it take light to travel that distance? And so the solar system, as you can see in this diagram, is a few light hours across. There's no real clean definition to how big the solar system is. So who's to say five, six, whatever, but a few light hours across. And just on the way, I had to show this image because I think it's a really nice image. So occasionally I just do that. I think there's an image that I have to show because it's just so nice. Um, this is Pluto and Sharon. They're not actually in this orientation. These are two separate images that have been put together so you could compare them. Um, but these are Pluto is the one in the lower right that looks a bit brighter and Sharon, um, Pluto satellite in the upper left. And these are images taken by the New Horizons satellite as it passed by. Uh, Pluto and Sharon. And Pluto and Sharon are five and a half light hours away from the sun, like I said. So it takes five and a half light, it takes five and a half hours for light to get from the sun to the outer solar system. On the scale of cosmology, that's still a tiny distance. So now we're going to zoom out. If we zoom out, oh, I forgot I had that joke buried in there. So you can see my son just flew in from the left hand side. Uh, flew in from the right to the left-hand side wearing a nice costume. If anybody knows what he's dressed as, that would be a great thing. Lots of people don't get that right. And the right answer is not a rocket. You have to name which rocket that is. Uh, it's a very specific rocket. Uh, anyway, that was his Halloween costume probably from about five or six years ago at this point. Uh, mostly made of duct tape. Because duct tape can be done. It can be used to make anything. Uh, so anyway, if we, had, if we want to study cosmology, we have to zoom out. And so I'll get there gradually. And what I wanna do is build an appreciation for the types of distances that we're talking about. Uh, when we're talking about cosmology, we wanna talk about groups of stars, galaxies, clusters of stars. But the first thing you can ask yourself is, well, typically how far apart are stars from one another? So the nearest star, the closest, closest star to our solar system is about four light years away. And you can see it on this slide, um, if you're looking at the slides right now. That's 25 trillion miles away. And what it means is that it is so far away from us that it takes light four years to travel from that nearest star to our solar system so that we can observe it. And so one of the amazing aspects of that is that when we look at this star, we don't see what it looks like today. We have no ability to see what it looks like today. We're seeing what that star looked like 4.2 years ago. Okay, that's just how vast the distances are. And that's the nearest star. That's the easiest star that we can make any observation of. And so now I'm gonna zoom out again. And if I continue this zoom, maybe the next interesting thing to look at is our galaxy. So here's just a picture of our galaxy. It's a long exposure. Actually, right now I've forgotten how long this exposure is. 
Um, but it's a long exposure of our galaxy. You can see the Milky Way running kind of from the upper left down towards the lower right of this diagram. Um, that is the galaxy in which we live. That is the Milky Way. The Milky Way is a collection of stars, which we call a galaxy. Um, the Milky Way looks like a band across the sky. And if you go to uh, a rural area away from the city or away from any major source of light, uh, you can see that band of light in the sky. It's not too terribly difficult to notice it. And that band of light is the few hundred billion stars that form our galaxy. And so now you can think about, well, how big is the Milky Way? How big is the galaxy in which we live? And so here is a really great image. This was take, an image taken by the Gaia satellite. Um, this is a map of the entire Milky Way galaxy. This is just like a globe in the sense that if I were to, if we were in person, I'd be able to demonstrate this a lot better, unfortunately. But if you're to think about an, obser uh, an astronomical observation, what you can do is you can look out from the Earth. The Earth is the only viewpoint from which we can look. We can look out from the Earth and we can look in all different directions and we can make a map. And we can look in all different directions, at least if we have access to every part of the surface of the Earth, uh, encompassing the surface of a whole sphere. So this map of the sky would actually look like the surface of a sphere, but in order to represent it on a computer screen or a projector or whatever it is that you're looking at it on, we uh, project it onto 2D. The same way the surface of the Earth is a sphere, but we make it flat when we make a map, okay? So if you were to walk off the left edge of this uh, map, you'd appear on the right-hand edge and just keep going. Okay, and that corresponds to basically just turning your viewpoint, turning your head around 360 degrees. And so this stripe across the sky is, a Mil is the Milky Way galaxy. The Milky Way galaxy is a disk galaxy. We live in that disk. That disk is about 100,000 light years across. And so galaxies are about 100,000 light years across. That's roughly how big they are. And so for the most distant stars in our galaxy, it takes 100,000 years for their light to get to us, which means it takes 100,000 years for any information from those stars to get to us, whether it's light or not, okay? And uh, galaxies are very large in another way. They're very large in the sense that the Milky Way galaxy and most similar galaxies, the Milky Way is a pretty typical galaxy, have about a few hundred billion stars in them, which is a huge number, a huge number of stars. Almost all the stars we suspect have planets around them all too. That's one of the big discoveries of the last 20 years. Um, this image also has two nice things in it that are not part of the main, point of my talk, but are kind of interesting to, to look at, uh, which are, you can see in the lower right part of the image below the disk, there are two bright spots that are not part of the disk. Those are two satellite galaxies, galaxies which orbit the, the Milky Way galaxy, two tiny smaller galaxies, they're called dwarf galaxies, which orbit the Milky Way galaxy. Those are the Magellanic clouds, the large and the small Magellanic clouds. Um, so that's cool. So that's the size of an individual galaxy. Now we haven't yet got, gotten to the scale of cosmology. Cosmology wants to deal with populations of galaxies. And so we zoom out one more time and I can ask the question, well, what does our nearest neighbor galaxy look like? And I'm kind of fibbing here in the sense that, well, I know, sorry, I flipped back. I know that I have the large Magellanic and the small Magellanic clouds, which are satellites of the Milky Way. But if I were to say, what's the nearest big giant galaxy? The nearest big giant galaxy is the Andromeda galaxy. And there's a Hubble ultra, uh, there's a Hubble Space Telescope image of the Andromeda galaxy. I'm about to show you the Hubble ultra deep field. So that's why I had that mistake. You can see that the Andromeda galaxy, like the Milky Way, has small dwarf galaxies that orbit around it. And one of them can be seen um, to the lower right, just below the Andromeda galaxy. It's pretty obvious if you look in that direction. You can also see that the Andromeda galaxy kind of look like it looks like it's a whirling disk, and indeed it is. Both the Milky Way and the Andromeda galaxies are whirling disks. To us, the Milky Way looks like a stripe across the sky because we're in the disk and we can't get away from the disk to get a better photo. Um, the Andromeda galaxy is a little bit inclined relative to us, so it looks kind of like an oval. But if we were to ask the question, well, what is the distance scale? The distance to the Andromeda galaxy is about 2 million light years, 2.2 million light years. Um, but you know, for our purposes, they're all the same. So that's interesting for many reasons. The first thing is that it tells us if we want to talk about galaxies and how galaxies behave, 
uh, or even populations of galaxies or the evolution of the universe, we have to deal with truly vast distances. So this is a distance along, uh, across which it takes light 2 million years to travel. And so it's interesting to apply the logic that I applied to the solar system and the galaxy to the Andromeda galaxy, because what this says is that, well, this is not a picture of the Andromeda galaxy today. This is what the Andromeda galaxy looked like 2 million years ago. Which is kind of a crazy thing to think about. That's 2 million years ago. That's what the Andromeda galaxy looked like. Now, based on everything we know about astronomy, it's very likely that it looks pretty similar today in the sense that not only are lengths greatly dist are greatly expanded when we want to talk about uh, the evolution of the universe, but time is in some sense distorted in the sense that not much happens within a galaxy in only two million, two million years. That would be considered a short period of time in the evolution of a galaxy. Our galaxy, the Milky Way and Andromeda are both about 5 billion years old. And so this is what a 5 billion year old giant galaxy typically will look like. These galaxies are both typical, uh, typical types of galaxies. Um, so now I'm gonna make one more zoom out and then we'll start getting into the science. The last zoom out is that image that I promised that I would show you, which is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Um, depending on where you're viewing this and how you're viewing this, I'm not sure how great it appears. Uh, I would encourage you to go to spacetelescope.org and look at the image yourself. You can download it at a variety of different resolutions uh, because it's really an amazing image. I usually say that it's one of the uh, most important images that has ever been taken in the history that's ever been made in any way, including art by all humanity. Um, and I've threatened many times and I've never done it, but maybe next time I will to just give an entire lecture about this one image because there's so much in this image that it's, it, it really is incredible. Um, the first thing that I find incredible is that the way this image was taken was to take the Hubble Space Telescope and expose it. In other words, open the shutter. Uh, knowledge of photography has been waning <laughs> recently since everybody uses their phones for everything. But leave the shutter open so that you can see dim things. Open the shutter, leave the uh, CCDs exposing uh, for something like 100 hours. One of the amazing things about this is that the Hubble Space Telescope orbits the Earth once every hour and a half. So this corresponds to something like 70 orbits around the Earth. And so one of the things that I think is amazing about this is the entire image here is about 1 65th the size of a full moon. Let's call it 1 60th the size of a full moon. So it takes 60 of these images all stacked up to fill the area on the sky that one full moon takes. So each of the, each of the, this image is a tiny, tiny patch of the sky. And so you can imagine that each of these galaxies that you see is also a very, very tiny portion of that patch. And so one of the things that's an amazing feat of engineering is that the Hubble Space Telescope, while it orbits 70 times, doesn't wobble at all, or at least doesn't wobble enough that such a tiny little feature gets blurred out at all by the wobbling of the Space Telescope. That's pretty amazing because you know if you were taking an image and you left the shutter open on your camera and you moved the camera around, all you get was a blurry image. Um, the thing that's amazing scientifically about this is you'll see a whole bunch of dots here. Some of the things that you see are clearly galaxies because they look kind of like the Milky Way and Andromeda galaxies that we already saw. There's an orange galaxy sort of in the lower right, uh, the lower center. There's a whitish spiral galaxy. You can probably see a handful of other galaxies scattered throughout this image. Um, the astonishing thing that I'm going to tell you is that the only things in this image that are not galaxies are the things that look as though they have a crosshair pattern on them, that make like a cross. Those are stars. I see one pretty close to the center of the image, just to the right of center. I see one at the bottom, bottom center. That's pretty red. Uh, there probably are a couple of others. I don't see any right now off the top of my head. But every other dot in this image is a galaxy, a galaxy of a few hundred billion stars. So that's a pretty astonishing fact to me, at least. And so in this image, there are tens of thousands of galaxies. This is a picture of tens of thousands of galaxies in a patch of sky that's 1 60th 
the size of a full moon. And so if you were to extrapolate, it's almost certainly the case that if we could take such a high quality image of the entire sky, we would have pictures of 100 billion galaxies. So it's an astonishingly large number of galaxies. Each of these galaxies itself has 100 billion stars. And the last amazing fact about this, and the thing that I wanted to get to uh, talking about zooming out in order to understand cosmology, is that these thousands of galaxies that you see in the Hubble Ultra Deep Field image, most of them are at least several hundred million light years away. Meaning that it took several hundred million years for the light to get from us to them, from them to us. We're seeing them, so the light left them and came to us. It took several hundred million years for the light to get from them to us, from these galaxies to us. Some of the redder ones are a different type of galaxy called an elliptical galaxy. And some of the very small red ones are just very, very distant galaxies. I see a handful of them in the upper left corner of the image, a handful of very small, tiny red dots. And the astonishing thing about all of those dots is that those are galaxies that look dim and small. And what they are are just galaxies that are incredibly far away. And I think the most distant galaxy for which we have a confirmed distance in the Hubble Ultra Deep Field is something like 12 billion light years away. And I always think that that's just a crazy number to think about. So when you're talking about co po populations of galaxies, you're talking about billions of light years on a scale. And some of those galaxies are billions of light years away. And when you start thinking about that, that gives you another crazy thought, which is when the light left that galaxy, our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, is something like 8 billion years old. Solar system is about 5 billion years old. And so when the light left that galaxy, the Milky Way had not even formed yet. So that galaxy formed, some stars grew up in that galaxy, they, emitted, they started emitting light, we see the light from that. When that light left that galaxy, the Milky Way was not even here yet. And so while that light was traveling from that galaxy to us, the Milky Way formed, and then a few billion years later, the solar system formed. And then after a few billion years of evolution, people evolved that built the space telescope that finally caught that light that had been traveling for 12 billion years. Uh, I think that's just a crazy way to think about how this has all happened. Um, and so that's, that's the sense of scale that I wanted you to get uh, when I'm talking about the universe. Now, it wasn't always appreciated. Now I'm gonna start transitioning into the science of cosmology. And it wasn't always appreciated um, that the study of the galaxies, and at first it wasn't even appreciated that they were galaxies, distinct galaxies outside of our own galaxy, um, could lead to lots of interesting science, but it can. And one of the first interesting discoveries uh, that was made in the early 20th century about uh, galaxies. At that point, they were called the spiral nebulae. Uh, was it a discovery made by Vesto Slipher? And what he did was he had developed a technique, we'll talk about the technique in a second, to measure the speed of the galaxy with respect to our solar system. So basically, he was trying to say, is the galaxy moving away from us? Is it moving towards us? And how fast is it moving away from us or towards us? And he was able to make a measurement of that. Um, the measurements are all such that if it's, you can see, if you can see the table that I'm projecting right now, the measurements are all such that if there's a plus sign in front of the measurement, it means that it's moving away from us. If there's a minus sign, it means it's a galaxy that's moving towards us. Okay. Um, Slipher no, noticed something that was strange. Um, this, is, this is among the first set of his observations. And then he made many more throughout his career. Uh, I believe he was the director of Lowell Observatory maybe until the 50s even or 60s. Uh, I can't quite remember exactly. Uh, but anyhow, one of the things that he noticed was that if you are to measure the speeds of the galaxies, almost all of them are moving away from us. Andromeda and three other galaxies, he noticed at first, are moving towards us. 
And those are the three at the top that are labeled with negative signs here. Um, at first he thought that was odd because the implication is that there's something strange about the position of the Milky Way in the universe. Why would the other galaxies be moving away from us? Uh, there was a lot of people who didn't quite understand what the interpretation was at that time. Uh, probably almost everybody didn't understand what, quite what the interpretation of that data was at that time. But we were starting to develop the techniques to understand what that data meant. Uh, and so before I get to that, what I want to explain to you is an important little bit of science, um, which details how Slipher made this measurement. And I think that this little short aside is important for a variety of reasons, which I'll hopefully remember to touch upon as we go. But basically he made a measurement through the study of something called a spectrum or from spectra as the plural. And so here is a spectrum, a single spectrum. This is a spectrum of the sun. It's a great spectrum to use for pedagogical reasons because it's, it can, the sun's close by and it can be done with super high resolution. And so what it is, is it's the light of the sun broken up into all its constituent colors. You could think about it as being done with a prism, although it's not actually done with a prism. Uh, modern spectra are not, are not, not made with prisms anymore. And there's tons of information in this spectrum. And so you can see many, many things in a spectrum. One of the obvious things that you can see here, and so actually I should say the first, that the way that you should interpret this spectrum is that it kind of reads like a book. Fundamentally, the way you'd wanna think about it is the light is spread out as it would be spread out by a prism. But in order to make this, the high resolution of the spectrum obvious to the viewer, it's been set on a set of different different lines. So like you read the top line from left to right, and then you continue on the next line below it, and next line below it, next line below it, and so on and so forth, until you go through the Roy G. Biv, all of the colors of the rainbow. One of the important things that you'll notice in this spectrum is that it's not continuous. It has a whole bunch of dark spots, dark lines in it. Those are basically areas where the light is to some degree missing. The sun is a bit dimmer than it is compared to what it is in the other colors. And that pattern of lines tells us uh, a lot about the sun. It tells us in particular what the constituents of the sun are and in what proportions. So for example, a measurement of the spectrum of the sun is what tells us that it's the sun is 74% hydrogen. The sun is actually 73% hydrogen. Most of the rest is helium. It's about a percent oxygen, uh, carbon, neon, other stuff like that. And then there are trace amounts of all kinds of other heavier, heavier elements. Okay. And that's all comes from this pattern of dark spots. And the reason is because every element has its own unique pattern of dark spots that it contributes to this diagram. So that's an amazing thing. And one of the amazing parts of this story is that uh, the element helium was first discovered in the sun before it was discovered on earth. In other words, it was discovered in the spectrum of the sun. People recognized a pattern of lines that didn't correspond to something that had been isolated in, a, in an earthbound laboratory before. So they called it helium because that means sun element, the element of the sun. And the fact is that helium is extremely rare on the earth. It doesn't appear naturally in the earth's atmosphere because it's so light that it evaporates off into space. Uh, maybe if somebody has some questions about that, we can talk about that more later, but I'll move on for now. And so one of the things that Spectre tell us is what everything is made out of. So that's one of the astonishing things that we'll talk about as we go along, which is I can look, or I'm, I do theoretical science, so I don't actually look, but my colleagues who do experimental science, who make the observations, they can actually look at galaxies or stars that are extremely far away, but they can know with very high precision what that object is made out of from the pattern that they see in the spectrum. And so we know the chemical elements that are present in distant galaxies and distant stars, which is kind of an astounding feat. The other thing that I wanted to touch on, which is what Slipher, what Besto Slipher exploited, is the fact that spectra can also tell us how far, how fast these objects are traveling relative to us. So if I go, to 
the next slide, what I'm illustrating in a cartoonish way, um, I have thought about making some kind of good movie here, but I just both ran out of time, but also didn't really have any unique ideas. Um, because the Doppler effect, I think, is something that's fairly familiar to many of us, even if you don't think about it in the way that this diagram is presenting it. Uh, so the Doppler effect is most commonly, uh, we most commonly experience it as the effect of a train or a siren going by. And so in that sense, I think you've probably heard something about the Doppler effect before. It's when a train is going by or a siren is going by and you hear it switch from high pitch to low pitch as it passes you. Mm. Okay, and the reason is because let's imagine, for example, uh, that this red dot is a star or a galaxy or some other source of light. And then it's moving to the left as this arrow um, indicates. If you're standing to the left of the arrow so that the red dot is approaching you, then the waves of light, which are represented by those blue lines, the waves of light that the source emits get compressed by the motion of the source itself. That changes the radiation to look as though it's shorter wavelength and higher frequency. In terms of sound, that means higher pitch. So when the siren is coming towards you or when the train is coming towards you, it's higher pitch than it actually is. You hear a higher pitch than the pitch being emitted by the source. On the other hand, if I were standing on the right-hand side of this diagram behind the source and the source is moving away from me, those wavelengths are spread out. So the frequency goes down, the wavelength gets longer and the frequency goes down. In terms of pitch, that corresponds to low pitch. So when the siren recedes from me, I hear a low pitch. Okay. In terms of light, high pitch or high frequency is blue, low pitch is red. And so if I see a spectrum that's shifted to the blue or the red, that tells me whether or not the object is moving towards me or away from me. And that's what I can do with stars or galaxies. Okay. In fact, I can even use the spectrum to tell me how fast, by how much is the wavelength or the frequency equivalently shifted. And that tells me how fast the object is moving. So I not only do I know whether or not it's moving towards me or away from me, I can tell how fast it's moving towards me or away from me. And so here's a, a, an illustration of that point. And this is basically what Slifer did. The top row here is the spectrum of the sun. It's basically the same spectrum I already showed. It's just rendered at lower resolution for pedagogical purposes. The lower spectrum is the spectrum of a distant galaxy. Now in the sun spectrum at the top, you can see a characteristic pattern of lines. Some of them are from, well, a few of them, a few of the big ones uh, are, four of the big ones are from hydrogen. There are some calcium lines there at the left, some sodium lines at the left and so on and so forth. But what I want you to notice is the spacing pattern of the lines for the, for the current purpose. And then look down at the spectrum of the distant galaxy. The spectrum of the distant galaxy basically has the same spacing pattern. It's just that the entire spacing pattern has been shifted to the right or shifted more towards the red part of the spectrum. That's not too surprising. Because what it's telling us is that, well, since the spacing pattern is probably due to the fact that all of the elements are the same, right? I get the same sequence of lines because the elements are the same. In other words, stars in a distant galaxy are made of hydrogen and helium, um, just like stars, just like the sun is made out of hydrogen and helium. But that distant galaxy is moving away from us. And so I shift the pattern to the red end of the spectrum, to the long wavelength end of the spectrum, to the lower frequency end of the spectrum. And for this particular galaxy, the speed corresponds to about 7% of the speed of light. So that shift here is 7% of the speed of light. And so that's how Slifer was able to deduce that the vast majority of galaxies, probably all the galaxies in this image, are moving away from us. Now it was Hubble that realized they were moving away from us in a very interesting way. And this is one of the things that made Hubble very famous. 
when Slifer made his measurements, like I said, it wasn't clear what the, what were called at that time, the spiral nebulae. Now we call them galaxies. It wasn't even clear what those objects were. And part of the reason it wasn't clear what those objects were is because it wasn't clear what, how far away they were. He didn't know if they were really dim things really close to us or if they were ginormous galaxies very far away from us. Of course, that's what they are. Now we know that they're giant galaxies, but they're just very far away from us. Now, one of the things that made Hubble famous was that he solved this problem by developing techniques to measure the distances to galaxies. He was able to say how far a particular galaxy is away from us. And with that addition to the data that Slifer had been taken, Hubble made this incredible diagram. I guess by modern terms, it would not be incredible. I'll show you an incredible version later that has modern data on it in which the errors are much smaller. But this is the first of what is called the Hubble diagram. And this is the first illustration of what we now call Hubble's law. And the plot is a plot of velocity measured in kilometers per second on the y-axis. I don't know why it says kilometers. All the old papers say kilometers, but they mean kilometer per second. And I don't know what the reason for that is. On the x-axis is distance in a unit called parsecs. But parsec is just about three light years. You can just think about it as three light years. So 10 to the six parsecs, which you see in the middle of your screen, is just 3 million light years. 1 million parsecs is about 3 million light years. 2 million parsecs, two times 10 to the six is about 6 million light years and so on and so forth. And Hubble noticed a really interesting correspondence between the velocities of galaxies and the distances to galaxies. Namely, that the further away a galaxy is, the faster it's moving in general, aside from those few exceptions. The few exceptions, Andromeda and the other smaller galaxies, the reason they're exceptions is that they're actually so close to the Milky Way that we're being gravitationally attracted to one another. Uh, and we could talk more about that if somebody has a question about that, but probably what will happen is that Andromeda and the Milky Way will collide in 4 billion years or so, something like that. And so this is the Hubble diagram. The reason why this is interesting is that this implies something really profound about the evolution of the universe. Because when you have a situation like this, what it implies is that it doesn't have to be that the Milky Way is at some special point in the universe where all the other galaxies are moving away from us. It could just be that the whole universe is expanding. And so Hubble's observation is often taken as uh, the earliest convincing evidence that the universe was expanding. And so one way to think about that and the way that I like to think about it is through this analogy of raisin bread. And so in the raisin bread, the idea is that each of the raisins is a galaxy. And what happens when bread, when you cook bread is hopefully it rises. And so as the bread rises, the whole bread expands in every direction. And so what happens is that each of the raisins moves further from the other raisins. And so you can see here that the expansion of raisin bread follows Hubble's law. If I have uh, two raisins, you can see in the initial diagram at the left that are separated by three centimeters, after the bread rises, now they're separated by six centimeters. And so if the bread was baking for, I don't know, half an hour, let's say, the bread was baking, let's call it an hour just for round numbers. The speed of that raisin relative to the other raisin is three centimeters per hour. But now if I look at the two raisins that are initially separated by 16 centimeters at the left-hand diagram, and I compare it to the right-hand diagram, now they're 32 centimeters apart. And so those two raisins are now, are, are now separated by 32 centimeters. Those two raisins have a relative speed compared to one another of 16 centimeters per hour. And so the further away an object is, the faster it seems to be expanding, the faster it seems to be moving away. And so you can see that in this case, there's no sense in which one raisin has to be the center of the bread. No matter what raisin you are, you see all of the other raisins moving away from you and they obey a Hubble's law. And so this was taken to be the first evidence of the expansion of the universe. And so now I wanna go back and I wanna say, well, 
how do we really know? I want to back up just for a second and I want to say, well, how do we really know that the universe is expanding? Is it really just based on this type of observation? And I think no, and I think this is where the next um, important lesson comes in. Because if I wanted to say all of that stuff, including the expansion of the universe, if I want to say, how do we know all of that stuff? How can it be that we can figure out all of that stuff? Is it just based on these accumulated facts that Slifer and uh, Hubble accumulated? And definitely that's not true. Um, what I would argue is that what you need is you need to have a theory within which to interpret all of these facts. And so one of the reasons why I think this is an important lesson that can be learned through the study of the universe is I think one of the things that goes wrong with teaching science nowadays is that people are way too focused on facts. And that's actually one of the interesting things this, that distinguishes talking to uh, a lay person versus talking to a scientist. The scientist almost doesn't care really about the facts. The facts are kind of incidental. What's way more important than the specifics of the facts are the theoretical frameworks in which those facts are interpreted. In other words, it's the theory that tells you almost everything. Facts are valuable, but the theory tells you almost everything. And I have here cited at the bottom of this page, a really great essay by Paul Krugman that makes this point in economics. Um, and basically his point, which I agree with, is that if you think that you can make a conclusion just from facts without a theory, then you're actually making the worst scientific mistake you can be, you can make, which is you have a theory, you just have no idea what your theory is. Your theory is just whatever your gut is telling you. And that's a really important lesson about how science works, I think, that everybody should learn to appreciate better. And so hopefully I'll get that point across as it pertains to the study of the universe as we go further. That's really the theory that tells you everything. You have to be able to interpret facts within the framework of a theory. So the first thing that I'll start with is the theory that leads to our theory of modern cosmology. That theory is called general relativity. General relativity is one of the many things, well, Einstein was already famous by the time he developed relativity. So maybe it's not one of the many things that made him famous, but it's arguably his greatest achievement. It is our modern theory of gravity. Einstein and many others in the early 20th century knew that there were problems with Newton's theory of gravity. And in particular, they were inconsistent with Einstein's special theory of relativity, which he had developed 10 years earlier. And so he sought a theory for gravity that would be consistent with everything else that was known at the time. Eventually he succeeded and he called it general relativity. Okay, so general relativity is a theory of gravity, but it's an odd theory of gravity. It's a theory of gravity in which, um, Gravity is not a force, but it is sort of the shape of space and time. And I thought about how I would try to explain that over Zoom, but I decided let's just punt on that. Um, <laughs> if somebody's interested, I can recommend things for people to read uh, rather than try to explain that over a Zoom call. Um, so there are a couple of things that I'll ask you to take on faith, which I hate to do. Uh, but I'm gonna to have to do that now just because the concept of the shape of space and time, I think it's too much to get into in, a, in a one Zoom call. The big point to appreciate is that in Einstein's theory of general relativity, it is not the case that objects move through space and that space is just passive. A better way to think about it is that objects themselves determine the, space, the shape of space, and they therefore determine how objects move through space. And so an orbit in the theory of general relativity is just caused by a dimple in space-time that's caused by uh, a massive object like the sun. So the sun creates a dimple in space-time and the, the earth whirls around the sun because it's whirling around the edge of this dimple. Okay. In the theory of general relativity, it turns out that the universe, the space available in the universe has to evolve with time. In other words, the universe cannot have the same volume today as it had yesterday. And the person who discovered this was a man named Alexander Friedman. And so to be consistent with Slipher's data, he proposed the idea that, well, maybe the universe is expanding. 
Now, unfortunately, he did not become the champion of this idea because he died shortly thereafter. And so somewhat ironically, the person who is largely recognized as, as the champion of modern cosmology is a Catholic priest named George Lemaitre. And he called it the primeval atom theory for the evolution of the universe. Nowadays, we call it the Big Bang Theory. But it's basically this idea that general relativity is the correct theory of gravity. And if you follow general relativity to its conclusions, it implies that the universe is expanding. And given our sort of raisin bread picture of what it means to have something expand, that explains everything that Slipher and Hubble had already observed. And this is the way that they probably would have thought about it. This is kind of a dry diagram, so I won't spend too much time on it. But the idea here is that I can think about the universe as a grid. The left-hand universe in this, in this image, which is labeled earlier time, has four galaxies on it. I labeled two as red and two as, as blue, just for a little variety. <laughs> and the idea of the expansion of the universe is just that the whole grid gets dilated, gets stretched out uniformly. And that's what this grid on the right-hand side means when it says a later time. And Einstein's theory describes in detail well, given the number of galaxies that are in the universe, how fast does that expansion occur? Or how much, how does that expansion accelerate and so on and so forth. And you can see that this diagram embodies Hubble's law, right? The, the objects that start further away move more distance in a given amount of time. And so that's great because this proportional, proportionality between distance and speed is exactly what we need in order to explain Hubble's law. The thing that I want to emphasize in light of this is that one of the things that people talk about, which is decidedly, I think, not true, is to think about the expansion of the universe or the Big Bang as an explosion. It's not an explosion. It's just that space gets dilated. It's kind of a crazy thing to say, but that just seems to be the fact. If I look at space, the amount of space between me and a distant galaxy, between us and some distant galaxy, the amount of space available between us and a distant galaxy will be more tomorrow than it is today. There will just be more space than there used to be. That's just the way it is, as far as we can tell at least. And so in this picture, all of space expands. There's no reason to have a center to the universe. There's no explosion associated with the Big Bang. It's just the natural motion of space expanding that general relativity would have predicted. And I tried to summarize that this in this kind of crude diagram, which I quite like, but it's a crude diagram. It only has three different galaxies in it that I just copied and pasted all over the place. Um, one of them is a ring galaxy. One of my favorite ring galaxies called Hoag's Object. Um, which you can see two of the bottom galaxies are Hoag's object. But anyhow, the point is, no matter what galaxy you lived in, what you would see is you would see all of the other galaxies moving away from you. The longer arrows on the more distant galaxies indicate that the farther the galaxy is away from you, the faster it's moving away from you, just like Hubble's law predicts. Just like Hubble's law, just like Hubble found in Hubble's law, just like general relativity predicts. And that's true for all of these galaxies in the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. That's the expansion of the universe. And you still might say that's not convincing. And I would agree with you. That, that alone would not be enough to convince me that this is the story of the universe. And so the natural thing that you have to ask if you're doing science is I have some facts. I have a theory that explains some of those facts. Now I have to ask what else happens within this theoretical framework and can I check to see if those things happen? And if those things also happen, then I start to become more and more and more convinced that this probably is the correct interpretation for those facts. That's the thing that you can't do if you've never developed a theory at all. You actually have no way to test whether or not the facts that you think lead to your correct interpretation of events actually do lead to that correct interpretation of events. It could be a million different ways to get to that interpretation, to those set of facts that correspond to different interpretations of the facts and therefore correspond to different decisions you might make, uh, different predictions you can make about the future, different devices you could invent. And so it's really important to go through these steps 
uh, scientifically. So what happens within this theoretical framework? And the person who started asking those questions was trying to understand how we can test the theory and how we can learn more, how we can exploit the theory to learn more about physics. And that person was George Gamow. Maybe a bit of an oversimplification, but I think he's definitely the most important figure when it comes to this. In the 40s and 50s, he actually has a, a, an interesting story for, <laughs> for many reasons. Uh, he defected from the former Soviet Union, uh, allegedly on his third try. The first two tries involved failed kayaking trips, one of them across the Black Sea. Um, but anyhow, he defected, came to the US, uh, worked on the area of science, which is now known as cosmology. But he asked, asked exactly this question, what other things does this theory imply? And can we go check for these things? And he made an astonishing uh, prediction. And I'm gonna put, put that prediction on a timeline of the evolution of the universe so that you can kind of see what he's talking about. I had to make this timeline um, fairly simple so that it would render nicely on a screen. Um, and it's not to scale at all. And there's lots of other shortcomings to it. You can see that the x-axis, which measures time, proceeds jumpy. It goes from one second to 400,000 years to 200 million years to 13.8 billion years, which is today. It does not express the expansion of the universe correctly. In the span of time covered by this, the universe is expanded by a factor of uh, a thousand trillion, trillion, trillion. No, is that true? A thousand, billion, billion, billion. But the basic idea is that time passes, the universe expands, and then when the universe expands, as the universe is expanding, stars, galaxies form, and we observe them today. The first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rewind this expansion. This is the thought experiment that um, Gamov wanted us to do, and to consider what's ha what happened 400,000 years ago. Because he realized correctly what should have happened. And the way to think about this is first to think about um, why, it seems like it's gonna be off topic, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring this home, I hope. He thought about saying, well, why is it that we see the surface of any object? Like, why do we see through some stuff and we see the surfaces of other stuff? And so good examples are, well, why is it that we see through the atmosphere and through, through uh, eight light minutes of space, 93 million miles of space, and now all of a sudden we see the surface of the sun, but we saw through all that other stuff. Why is it that we see through most of the atmosphere until we, we see the surface of a cloud? Now, most of you would correctly, would, would guess something that's kind of on the path towards correctness, meaning you would probably say, well, most of space is empty, so the light travels freely from the sun to us, but the sun is very dense, the Earth's surface is very dense, or our eyes are very dense. And so we see the last thing through which light cannot freely travel, which would be the surface of the sun. And that's basically the correct answer. So in other words, if I were to cast this in terms of an explanation for why do we see the surface of, the, of a cloud, it's because the universe is relative, uh, the universe, the atmosphere is relatively thin. The atmosphere also does not contain that many um, molecules that interact with visible light. And so visible light passes relatively unimpeded through most of the atmosphere, but then it hits something that's very dense and very reflective, this, the cloud. And all of a sudden, that, the fact that that thing is so dense means that we see a surface there. Light is no longer traveling unimpeded once it, once, once it goes traces back to the surface of that cloud. And so Gamov, made an astonishing point, which turns out to be true. And what he's proposed is, well, if the universe is getting bigger, that means it used to be smaller. It's getting less dense, so it used to be more dense. And so he said, well, if we take this, this theory, if we take this theory seriously, we should be able to rewind the evolution of the universe to a time when it was way more dense than it was today. And in fact, we should be able to rewind the evolution of the universe to a time where the entire universe was so dense that visible light could not have passed unimpeded through the universe. And that's exactly what happens. 
Now, he didn't know it at the time. He predicted it, that this should be true. This should be an observable thing. Actually, he didn't predict that it should be observable. So he predicted that we should see the radiation from this time, the radiation that comes from this surface that represents the time at which the whole universe was so dense that light couldn't travel through it unimpeded. That's what this surface, that's what this ring in this diagram is trying to represent, that surface. And the reason why it's represented by a ring, it would actually be a sphere completely encompassing us. The reason why it's represented by a sphere in this diagram is because as we look out, just like in the uh, case with the Andromeda galaxy, or just like in the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, as we look out, we're also looking further back in time. So if I can look out into space, eventually I should be seeing light that comes from so far away that it comes from a time when the universe was so dense that light couldn't travel through it. And so I should see a surface basically blocking my ability to see any further. And that's what this ring around our Milky Way galaxy represents. And of course, this would be true for any galaxy. Every galaxy would see the same ring. That's one of the virtues of this theory. That radiation, that light is called the cosmic microwave background. And the reason why I say he didn't predict that, he predicted that it should be there, but he actually wrote, I think in his first paper, something along the lines of, Unfortunately, the technology to detect this will probably never exist. Um, but he was luckily wrong about that. Uh, because these two guys, Robert Wilson and Arno, Arno Penzias, discovered it uh, a little less than 20 years later, in the mid-60s. They discovered it quite by accident using the uh, horn antenna that you can see behind them in the image on the left. Uh, they were trying to study the ability to communicate with satellites through a horn antenna. And no matter where they pointed the antenna, they saw um, radiation, didn't know what it was caused by. Um, and eventually, uh, Penzias was on an airplane with somebody who knew somebody at Princeton who'd been working on theories of cosmology and said, uh, I think you better talk to this guy. <laughs> And they later discovered that they had one, they had, they later figured out that they had discovered the cosmic microwave background, the radiation that's left over from the early stages of the evolution of the universe. They won the Nobel Prize for it uh, about 11 years later. Um, there's a lot of details of that story that are super interesting. Again, it's another thing that I can't really get into in a one hour uh, Zoom lecture. Um, but they spent years basically trying to figure out what was wrong with their telescope before they finally realized that there was nothing wrong with their telescope, they had discovered the microwave background. In the lower right, you can see a satellite called the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe. It's one of the more modern, um, it's a satellite. Um, it's one of the more modern um, observatories that have been used to measure the microwave background. And it's named after one of the people that was working at Princeton at the time. Uh, on the microwave background. And that was launched in 2000 or so. And its first data appeared in 2003, was released in 2003. Um, and it gives us really super precise measurements of the microwave background, which we can use today. So this is kind of an amazing story because the existence of the microwave background is something that was predicted by the theory the theory that the universe is expanding. And so if it's expanding, it used to be denser. The discovery of the microwave background, as it was predicted, is amazing because it means that any of the other theories that don't have that feature, that don't have the feature of a universe that evolved from a denser, hotter state, had to be ruled out. And so that's another important lesson, lesson about how science proceeds, is that all you can do is rule out the wrong options. You can never confirm 100% that you have the right option, right? And so you're hoping that you're getting closer and closer to the truth just by ruling out the things that can't be true. And so most scientists are actually spending most of their time, time trying to prove things false rather than trying to prove things to be true because you can't prove something to be true. Okay. Another amazing thing is that, which I'm just gonna tell you is that this is an image much like the image of the Milky Way in the sense that it's a, 3D image, a 3D globe-like thing, flattened, 
a sphere-like surface flattened onto a map of the microwave background. It's pretty featureless. Um, the green that you see everywhere is just the microwave background. The white in the middle of the diagram, the, of the middle of the image, is just the radiation from our galaxy. So you can rule that out. That's something that gets in the way of our view of the distant universe. If I turn up the contrast on this image, this is what the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe measured. This is the contrast turned up by a factor of about 100,000. So you can see that there are tiny fluctuations in the intensity of the radiation. Where it's redder, it's a little bit more intense. Where it's bluer, it's a little bit less intense. That's because where it's redder, it's a little bit denser. Where it's bluer, it's a little bit less dense. And then if I turn up the contrast a little bit higher, this is the most modern measurement of the microwave background taken by the Planck satellite. And you can see tons of structure, tiny red dots, little blue dots. And I don't have time to get into this, but the thing that I'm, the thought that I'm going to leave you with is that the story gets even better in the sense that in the early 70s, people started trying to predict, well, what should fluctuations in the intensity of the microwave background look like? Now we know the microwave background is there. It has roughly the intensity that um, gamma predicted. What should fluctuations in this intensity look like? And these are teeny tiny fluctuations. So like if you're seeing uh, uh, teeny tiny fluctuations in density, meaning let's say the average density is 100,000 protons in a little patch the size of one of these blue dots, just for argument's sake. A red dot has 100,001 protons for every 100,000 protons in a blue spot. So these are teeny fluctuations in density and teeny fluctuations in intensity. Nevertheless, they can be both predicted and measured. So in the 70s, people started this program to predict what these fluctuations look like, should look like. And the thought that I'm gonna leave you with is that this pattern, which looks complicated, is exactly the way it was predicted. That's the thing that really, I think, seals the deal for me. It's pretty amazing. Knowing what we know about how hydrogen atoms and protons and electrons and light behave, we can take knowledge of the fact that the microwave background exists. We can say, well, if it really is due to the expansion of the universe, it should have this pattern. And it actually does have that pattern. And one of the reasons why I think this really seals the deal for me is because this is a very non-trivial pattern, right? This is not just like, well, some of it should be blue, some of it should be red. <laughs> this is a very specific thing. And the observation matches this very specific prediction. Again, that prediction is extremely technical. So it's something we can't get into, but just the fact that that can be done and has been done means that there's very strong evidence that this is the right track in terms of understanding the evolution of the universe. Before we finish up and before we uh, move on to the remaining mysteries about the universe, I just wanna to touch on one thing I might do it I might accelerate my pace a little bit, but I might, I'll do it pretty quickly just because I think it is interesting and I think it is something that doesn't get enough attention. The next thing that Gamov turned his attention to was the first few minutes in the evolution of the universe, which is the synthesis, the time at which the light elements were synthesized. And basically he did this, he made, he went through the same set of logic. He said, well, eventually if I rewind the evolution of the universe, the universe is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, hotter and hotter and hotter, denser and denser and denser. Eventually I get to a time in the evolution of the universe where it must have been so dense and so hot, it's kind of like the interior of a star. Not only can there be chemical reactions, well, actually there can't be chemical reactions because there aren't any chemicals yet. It's hotter than what it is required for chemical reactions by a factor of a million. And so what you have are nuclear reactions. You can actually change the elements that exist in the universe at this time. The basic idea I'm trying to get across in this image is that when the universe is dense enough, that's this first panel that I'm showing, nuclear reactions are occurring. So for example, protons are colliding into each other. Sometimes a proton will turn into a neutron through what's called a weak interaction. And you'll start forming helium and lithium and things like that that way. As the universe expands, the universe becomes more diffuse and eventually it becomes so diffuse that protons, neutrons, helium, deuterium, which is a 
an isotope of hydrogen, those objects no longer collide with one another. And even if they did, the universe had expanded so much that it's cooled so much that when they do, they don't expand particularly violently. So they can't undergo nuclear reaction. It's actually a good thing because you don't want nuclear reactions just happening all over the place, right? Um, and so whatever you're left with, once the universe expands by enough to shut off nuclear reactions, are the elements from which you start building everything else. And so deuterium, helium, and lithium were produced at this time. And in fact, what you can do, I'm not gonna show you the equivalent diagram because it's a little bit dry, is you can predict, you can go through the same process. You can say, I can predict how much hydrogen, how much helium, how much lithium, how much deuterium should be produced in the early universe. And I can compare it to what we have in modern observations. And the amazing thing is that you get the right number. The part of the story I'm not gonna tell you about is all of the heavier elements, oxygen, carbon, iron, silicon, you know, manganese, uh, neon, um, gold, all of those other things are produced in stars one way or another. I'm not gonna tell you anything about that story, but I think that's another amazing story. And so I've summarized this in this chart where you can see that four of the lightest elements, well, three of, three of the lightest elements and one isotope are produced in the early universe. So some of the lithium in your cell phone battery is definitely was produced in the, I, I would almost without a doubt was produced um, in the first 20 minutes of the evolution of the universe. It made all it made its way to your cell phone battery. Which is kind of amazing. So that's another amazing part of this story is you can make that prediction, which is extremely non-trivial and it all holds together. And none of this would be possible if you didn't have a detailed theoretical framework within which you can interpret a variety of facts. And now you can keep doing that. So for example, you can look at the pattern of galaxies on the sky. This is a map of where galaxies live. Every dot in this image is a galaxy. And you can say, can I use the same theory to predict the clustering pattern of galaxies, if you want to call it that? The way, the way galaxies cluster together in this map, is that what we would predict? And in fact, that's true. Here's a simulation of that happening using only just what we know about the laws of physics. It's not rendering great on my screen right now, so it's probably not rendering great on your screen. But hopefully you can squint enough to see that these patterns are roughly consistent with one another. Um, if not, you'll just have to believe me because this gives another amazing part of the story. Here's what I can do. I can take what I know about their microwave background in the upper left. The microwave background tells me which patches of the universe are a little bit denser than the other patches. Knowing that, I can use the laws of gravity to figure out how should those galaxies, how should those dense patches and under dense patches evolve under gravity? The dense patches become denser, eventually become galaxies. The diffuse patches become even more diffuse, eventually become empty, become voids where there are no galaxies. And I can say after 13 billion years of this process happening, what would the pattern of galaxies look like? And indeed, it looks like the observed pattern of galaxies, which you again see here in the lower right of the plot. So you can basically take the initial condition of the microwave background, you can evolve it forward using the known laws of physics, and you can get the observed patterns of galaxies. Really strong evidence that we know the right story for the history of the universe, I think. And so this is all great. And the last thing that I wanna leave you with before I close is that it's not the end of the story. Hopefully what I tried to convince you, you know, even though I had to be a little bit glib on a few things because we only have an hour together, is that first of all, theory is the fundamental thing that you need in order to do science. Okay, it is not true that you can make an observation that tells you something if you don't have a theory within which to interpret that observation. That's one of the things you should always remember when you're telling other people facts also. The fact by itself doesn't really, doesn't necessarily mean what you think the fact means. In fact, if you don't know the theory that in which, within which the facts can be interpreted, it probably, you probably don't know what the facts mean. 
So that's a really important thing. And I think that's the biggest thing that gets missed in science education these days is you have to know the theory within which to interpret the facts. Now, this isn't where we stop, of course, because now what we want to do is we want, we know that we have laws of physics that we have yet to discover. And so one of the things we can do is we can say, well, let's look for the places where the theory breaks. That's actually the interesting stuff because that's the potential areas where we can learn new laws of physics. And there are a couple of those that we know about today. And so those two things are what we call dark matter and dark energy. And as we close, I'll just give you a brief introduction to what those might be, and then I'll stop and take questions. So usually when I say that, people have this kind of look on their face. This is my son, actually. Like, what is dark matter and dark energy? That's, that's, what I'm basically telling you is that there are um, galaxies that are mostly made up of things. In fact, the whole universe is mostly made up of things that are not protons, neutrons, and electrons as we normally think about them. So the early evidence for dark matter, among the earliest pieces of evidence for dark matter, I got a little ahead of myself with that last slide, comes from an observation made by this man, his name is Fritz Zwicky. Uh, he's a Swiss astronomer. And what he did was he looked at this cluster of galaxies. So part of the reason why I wanted to show this is just it's a really nice image. This is way higher quality data than he had access to at the time. But it's a cluster of galaxies known as the Coma Cluster. It's relatively nearby. It itself is relatively large. It's a couple uh, million light years across. And what it is, it's a collection of a thousand or so galaxies. And he used the redshifts to measure the speeds of all the galaxies. And he said, well, if I know the speed of the galaxy, I can determine what the gravitational force is within the cluster, and I can figure out how much mass is there. It was a very basic test that he wanted to make to measure the masses of the galaxies in the coma cluster. But what he found out was that there was way more mass there than you could reasonably account for from the stars, from what he called in the quote that I'm showing right now, the luminous matter. So in other words, we roughly know the mass of the sun. We know how bright the sun is. If we assume the stars in these galaxies are similar to the stars in our galaxy, then they seem to be way too heavy for the amount of light that they're giving off. And so he coined the phrase dark matter. He said, there must be some dark matter in this cluster that holds it together. Now at first, you know, Zwicky was kind of an ornery man. I have stories about Zwicky that are kind of funny too, but I don't have time to share. And so I, I don't know if that hurt his case, but this was the only piece of evidence for dark matter. A few people actually confirmed that this was true in other clusters also. Um, Sinclair, very shortly after Zwicky, looked at the Virgo cluster, I believe. But he was kind of an ornery man, and this was the only piece of evidence. Of, you know, so things kind of didn't take off right away uh, for dark matter. But what happened was people started looking at other objects other evidence surfaced, I should say, uh, maybe 30 or 40 years later. So here's a picture of Vera Rubin. And Vera Rubin was an astronomer working in the late 60s and 70s. And one of the things that she did that was a huge contribution to the field was she made very high quality observations, spectroscopic observations of the gas in the Andromeda galaxy. So here's that Andromeda galaxy again. The Andromeda galaxy rotates in the sense that I'm showing. The upper right part is actually moving sort of into the screen away from us. The lower left part is moving towards us. And so that's why I've colored them red and blue. The part moving away from us is red shifted. The part moving towards us is blue shifted. She measured the speed of the rotation and she thought, well, the speed of the rotation, just like Zwicky, the speed of the rotation should tell us the mass of the Andromeda galaxy. And what she found out was that the material in the galaxies is moving too fast to be explained only by the mass contained in the stars and in the interstellar gas, in the luminous material. Further evidence for dark matter. And it turns out that I fibbed earlier when I said that this test is true. One of the interesting things that's true about this test is that if I take the initial conditions of the, Milky, uh, the microwave background, and I try to evolve them forward in time, 13.8 billion years, and predict the pattern of galaxies on the sky that we see today, it only works if we have dark matter. 
And so we have all of these three pieces of evidence all pointing towards the existence of some sort of dark matter in the universe. And so we think that there is dark matter. Now we have lots of other evidence. Here's an ex example of, <coughs> excuse me, dark matter that comes from a phenomenon called gravitational lensing. You can see the three, there are actually four of them. Three of them are more prominent. The three really bright spots surrounding a central red galaxy. Those are actually images of the same background quasar. And the reason why we see three, we see four images of that background quasar is because there's a phenomenon called gravitational lensing going on um, in this system where the light from the background quasar is being bent and can, uh, can reach us from four different directions. The amount of bending of that light tells us how much mass is in this cluster. And it indicates that there's tons of dark matter. So there's lots of evidence that something is out there that we have not yet detected on the earth. That's one of the pieces, that's one of the evidence. That's one of the mysteries of the universe. That's one of the mysteries that we have yet to deal with. That's one of the failings of the modern theory if you wanna think about it that way. It does not yet include dark matter. We don't know what the dark matter is, is another way of saying that. And if I were to put the Milky Way to scale, our current picture would be that the Milky Way looks like this, residing within a dark matter halo, a dark matter blob, that's 10 times as big as the Milky Way, 10 times in one dimension, a thousand times in terms of volume, as big as the Milky Way. Which is kind of a crazy thing to think about, but as far as we can tell, it's probably true. And so that's part of why we think about the universe as being only 4% of the normal matter, 22% of the dark matter. And the last energy is also shown in this pie chart. The last mystery is also shown in this pie chart, the dark energy. The dark energy was a very recent discovery where people were basically trying to confirm the expansion of the universe because what people thought was, well, if the universe is expanding, it should at least be decelerating because galaxies pull on each other gravitationally or some story like that. And so there was a large effort to measure the deceleration of the universe uh, in the 90s. Now, what they discovered is that the expansion of the universe is actually accelerating. And these guys made that discovery in 1998 and won the Nobel Prize in 2011 for it. And in particular, what they discovered was that while we would have expected the, ex the expansion of the universe to be decelerating, in other words, galaxies move more slowly tomorrow than they, than they do today. What they actually discovered is that the expansion of the universe is accelerating. Galaxies are moving further, faster. They're moving away from each other faster tomorrow than they will be today, than they, would today, than they, than they are today. They're moving faster today than they were yesterday. But very recently, for some reason, very recently in a cosmological sense, meaning a few billion years ago, for some reason, the universe's expansion started to accelerate. And we have no idea what caused it. We just call whatever causes it dark energy. <clears throat> That's another piece of science that is not part of our standard theory. It's one of the mysteries that we have yet to deal with. And both of those things, I think, will probably lead to the discovery of new laws of physics. And that's the final part of this um, pie chart. That's why I told you that this is probably true, that the normal matter is 4% of all matter. Dark matter is 22% of all matter. And dark energy is about 74% of all matter because of this story that I just told you. Now, hopefully what will happen is that eventually we'll make progress in the same way. We'll develop theories, we'll test those theories. Eventually a lot of evidence will be accumulated that support those theories. And we'll have a, an interpretation for the dark energy and the dark matter that leads us toward new um, laws of physics. Even if we don't, these searches have already borne fruit. And one of the things that I think um, is important to emphasize is that um, all of this scientific inquiry leads to um, practical applications in unexpected ways. And so the dark matter is one of my favorite examples of this. There are a few others that I mentioned, but they're kind of obvious in the sense that let's take spectra. People originally studied spectra for astronomical purposes, but now we use spectroscopy all the time in laboratories just to determine the, chem the, the chemical compositions of all kinds of materials, particularly metals. 
But the study of dark matter, it's not obvious that it leads to a practical application. But indeed it, it has in the sense that a lot of the devices that people have built to try to detect dark matter on the earth as it's flying through the earth can now be used to monitor nuclear power plants from far away because they can detect particles that are emitted from those power plants called neutrinos. And they can determine, for example, if somebody in some faraway country is producing nuclear weapons just by detecting whether or not they're seeing high energy neutrinos coming from that place. So there's all kinds of interesting applications that come about from this uh, study of the universe in addition to hopefully learning new laws of physics. So that's where I'm going to stop. I know that I went over here. That's my summary slide. I'm done. Um, yeah, I'm done. <laughs> that's all I have to say. Thank you all for joining us, Andrew. That was awesome. Um, you know, I'm probably speaking for everyone watching right now that I learned so much and it, it kicked off a lot of fascinating questions to think about. Um, we had a few questions that uh, came in. Um, during your talk. Uh, one was about helium. Um, basically, how we're using helium in astronomical research today, um, and uh, if there is a global helium shortage and how to how to mitigate that. Oh, that's a good question. Um, the short answer to both of those is yes. So let's go back a little bit. I'm going to go back to my inspector slide. So helium is an interesting, helium is really interesting, I think, because of the fact that it's not, um, I don't know if this is the right one to show, but it doesn't really matter maybe. It's not abundant at all on the earth. Uh, I don't know how many people are aware of where it comes from, but the vast majority of the helium that we use for industrial purposes and things like that comes from underground mines. So what happens is that large elements that are radioactively unstable, um, they decay in a particular way that emits helium nuclei. And that's where the helium comes from. So if you're even natural gas mine, if you have a natural gas mine, there'll be helium down there in the rocks that's been captured in the rocks due to these decays that we can hopefully capture and use for a variety of purposes like making balloons and MRI machines and stuff like that. Um, so there is a helium shortage. Um, I guess it depends what you mean by shortage. There is worry that there can be a helium shortage. What's happening now is that the price of helium is going up which is what happens whenever something becomes scarcer and scarcer. Helium is used in a variety of astronomical pieces of equipment, but it's in such a tiny amount compared to what's needed for industrial purposes um, that it's not really economically relevant to the economics of helium. Um, but it's used primarily actually to cool things. And actually that's used, it's used in a wide variety of scientific fields to keep things cool. Um, so yeah, that's that's the that's the summary of helium. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, we had a question too um, about uh, the picture of the black hole, the famous picture from last year. How we were able to obtain that image, um, and how did telescopes around the world team up to make a virtual telescope? How did that How did that work? Oh, okay. That's a, that's an interesting uh, topic. That's not a project that I worked on myself, but I do know something about it. And in fact. Um, one of my friends uh, is a theorist working with that team, so I know a little bit about how it was done. Um, it's an interesting it's an interesting story from many respects. Sorry, I had a little problem with my desk here that I was fixing in real time. <laughs> uh, it's an interesting story from many respects because, uh, in fact, when I speak to a lot of people, they assume that the picture that was taken was from the black hole at the center of our galaxy. Hmm. That's actually not true. It's, it's from a more distant, it was from a distant galaxy, obviously more distant galaxy than the galaxy we live in. Um, and there's kind of a game that you have to play there, um, which is, I guess part of it is easy to understand. So part of it is just that our galaxy as galaxies go have a, has a fairly small central black hole, only a few million times the size of the sun. Um, now the fact that it's close makes it easy to see, but the fact that it's far away Sorry, the fact that it's close makes it easy to see. The fact that it's small makes it harder to see. Um, and so what they had gambled on was that this larger um, black hole in this more distant galaxy, the larger makes it easier to see, but more distant makes it harder to see, 
is would be easier to to make it to make this image construct this image of and indeed they turned out to be right it looks like um now how they did it is um i'm trying to think of a good way to explain that in short order it is a complex i think the best way to say it is just a comp it really is a complex coordination of activity because you have to take um what's the short way to say this so one thing maybe that that listeners should appreciate is that um if i want to see something really small it means i need to have a bigger telescope or i need to have multiple telescopes that are further apart from each other and the further apart i can put those telescopes the finer detail it lets me see on the source that i'm looking at and so what happens now is you basically if you have telescope if you have observatories spaced in different places around the earth you're trying to use sort of like the size of the earth as the size of your telescope to get higher and higher resolution. And so what happens is you observe some radiation at one telescope on one part of the earth, some radiation in another telescope at another part of the earth. But then what happens, it's a really complicated signal processing problem. And this is actually where I don't have the expertise to, to say exactly what happens. But basically what you have to do is make sure you have the timing between the, observ the observation at one telescope and the observation in another telescope very precisely measured. You have to combine those signals. And so in a way such that they're timed very accurately right relative to one another so that you can reconstruct that image. So I think it's just a super careful collaborative effort to collect data from a large number of telescopes all over the world. I think that's really the short story. And a lot of people didn't think they were gonna be able to do it at least 10 years ago or so when they started doing it, a lot of people didn't think they would succeed. Wow. Uh, so we have a question about dark matter. Um, mm -hmm. It talks about dark matter in our galaxy. Is there dark matter in our solar system, here on Earth, in my backyard? And is it interacting with everyday stuff, or is it just something that's out there? The first part I can answer. The second part, nobody knows the answer to. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, well, maybe I shouldn't say. I, I'm being a... I, I, I've been won over to one of the theories for what dark matter is. And that's kind of why I said that. Now, this is a little bit different from what most of what I talked about today in the sense that we don't yet have that super convincing evidence for dark matter. In other words, we already know, I would say, I hate to use the word, it's a fact because never nothing is ever 100% proven, but we have so much evidence about the history of the universe that I'm pretty confident in saying that the universe is 13.8 billion years old is as close to a fact as I can get if that makes sense. With dark matter, it's a little less clear. Now I've been won over, but this is really just a prejudice. I don't really have a lot of strong evidence to argue in favor of this, to the idea that the dark matter is just some new type of particle that we have not yet discovered. And part of the reason that I think that that's not that crazy is because we know of particles that are very similar to them. And the particles that I mentioned right at the end of the talk are very similar to what we think dark matter would have to be. And that's namely neutrinos. We know that dark matter is not neutrinos, but neutrinos have the same property as dark matter might have, which is that they do not interact with light. They don't give off light, they don't absorb light. And that's what makes them extremely hard to detect. The reason why the neutrinos are not dark matter is that they're very light. We need something that's heavier. Um, but it doesn't, given that perspective it doesn't seem that outlandish that there could just be some other particle that has similar properties to a neutrino and just happens to be heavier for some reason that we don't know yet um, so if that's true then the answer is yes dark matter is in our galaxy dark matter is in our solar system it's all over the place it's in my backyard it's in my office right now um, it's passing through our bodies all the time but it's not interacting with us that's another really important thing. So if I take the example of neutrinos, we are being bombarded by neutrinos all the time. So there were neutrinos that were produced in the Big Bang. They're going through our bodies constantly. There are very high energy neutrinos, well, relative to the Big Bang neutrinos that are coming from the sun and going through our bodies all the time. Neutrinos, since they don't interact with proton, well, they don't interact with charged particles. They don't interact through electrical charge. They're electrically neutral. And they don't interact via light. 
they're very unlikely to actually interact with any of the atoms in my body or my backyard or my desk or anything like that. And so really what we have is a picture of neutrinos that pass freely through almost everything they go through. Um, and that's actually an amazing thing that has been exploited by an astronomical observatory in Antarctica called IceCube. I have 30 more seconds to explain how IceCube works. So I think it makes a really astonishing point about neutrinos and probably about dark matter. Um, the Antarctica, the telescope in Antarctica and isn't really a telescope the way you'd think about it. It is a block of ice. It is a kilometer cubed in the Antarctic ice. It's been instrumented with a whole bunch of detectors, but it actually looks for neutrinos that come, primarily it looks for neutrinos that come from the North Pole rather than from the South Pole. And the reason is because at the surface in the atmosphere, you can actually produce neutrinos from other things like muons, for example, or other cosmic rays hitting the atmosphere and then producing neutrinos. And that's not the neutrinos that this experiment mainly wants to measure. This experiment mainly wants to measure neutrinos from distant astronomical sources like the sun or other galaxies, active galaxies. And so what it does is it looks through the North Pole, almost the whole Earth, to find neutrinos that come in through the North Pole, pass through the whole Earth, and then finally hit the detector. And the reason is because the Earth itself filters out all the other stuff the muons or the cosmic rays that would give rise to other backgrounds. So that's probably how dark matter works, it would be my guess. Uh, but there are other options. People have proposed that dark matter might be black holes. Um, I've never really found that to be a compelling argument, but there was a super interesting discovery last week, maybe two weeks ago, either last week or two weeks, ago, I can't remember exactly the date of gravitational waves from black holes that were merging that were larger than any that had been observed before. And they were in fact large enough that they start to get into that interesting range for, you know, maybe they could be dark matter type thing. Um, so you don't know if it's, if it's black holes, then they're not passing through my body and they're not passing through your backyard all the time. There are very few of them and they're just scattered throughout the galaxy and very rarely coming near anything. Uh, could you speak a little more about gravity? Uh, is it a force that causes things to happen or is it something else now? That's a good question. Um, I'll give two answers to that because I never like to give one answer because then you're likely more likely to be wrong. <laughs> um, in the context of Einstein's theory, gravity is not, I like to think about Einstein's theory as gravity not really being a force. Gravity, um, in Einstein's theory sort of bends space and then particles just follow the bend. If you wanna think about it that way, I don't really have a better way to, to describe it, unfortunately, remotely. Um, and the more massive an object, the more it bends space. And so what happens is that the sun is really big. And so it bends space enough that Mercury and Venus and earth and all the planets are basically captured in this little dent that it's made in space. Um, but there's, they don't experience any force acting on them in the sense that, um, well, actually Einstein summed it up. I don't know if this is a true story or not, but it's a story. <laughs> and people say that, you know, one of the things that made Einstein think of the theory of relativity was when he saw a painter fall off a roof at Princeton and he realized it doesn't hurt while you're falling. The thing that hurts is the landing. And that made him think, well, while I'm moving, it's not, I'm not actually experiencing a force. I only experience the force when I hit the ground. Um, and that's a peculiarity of gravity that may be true. Um, so it may not be a force the way we think about the other forces. Now, if I wanted to change gears and give my second answer a little bit, one of the things that most physicists would say is probably a problem with general relativity, even though it works for most things on large scales, like the scale of the universe, for example, is that general relativity naively is inconsistent with quantum mechanics. 
And most physicists think there probably is some way to unite those ideas. And that once we figure out how to unite those ideas, we'll realize that, well, gravity really is a force. And it's just very well described by this geometrical picture that uh, Einstein had. So I don't know, that's a, that, uh, I'm basically Great. saying it could be either one, but. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we also had a couple guesses um, on your son's uh, rocket. Uh, we got Saturn V from a couple visitors to Facebook. There and, we go. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what's what's next for you, and how can we follow your research at the University of Pittsburgh? Oh, uh, that's a good question. Um, right now, I'm really trying to learn more about the dark matter problem. Mm -hmm. That really has, I had spent the last few, several years doing more things along the dark energy line, but now I've sort of been reinvigorated to turn back. That's one of the luxuries you have when you're a theoretical scientist, you can move back and forth a little bit. I've really been reinvigorated to learn more about um, how we can test theories of dark matter. And one of the things I'm really interested in nowadays is something that I think could potentially be interesting, but people haven't, other uh, cosmologists haven't paid enough attention to right now, up to now, which is the possibility that dark matter could subtly change the properties of stars and that maybe we could observe that. Not necessarily maybe the sun, but maybe by looking at groups of stars, clusters of stars, we could find ways in which, um, the properties of those stars have been subtly changed. And the reason why I think that's really promising is we now know enough about different galaxies and different environments within our galaxy to actually pinpoint areas where you can say, oh, there's a lot of dark matter there and there's not much dark matter there. And there's a lot of dark matter there and not much dark matter there. So you can say, well, in the places where there's not much dark matter, stars should look exactly the way we expect them to look based on our standard theories about stellar evolution. And then I can, go and compare them to the way they look in these other regions and say, well, are there any subtle systematic differences between these stars? And so that's one of the things that I'm really, really interested in trying to make some progress on in the next couple of years, at least. Um, we have one last question uh, about spectroscopy. Um, and that was how, uh, uh, basically how that's measured now and how we, we look at this spectra from other stars. Ah, okay. That, okay. Astronomical spectroscopy. Yeah. That's a good question. Um, See, I'm, I'm debating again on what's the level of what's the right level of detail here. So basically, uh, and, and this is not, it, it, at its basic level, it's not a super new technology in the sense that I like to give the uh, analogy of a prism because everybody knows what a prism is. Everybody knows what, how a prism works. There's another simple experiment you can do at home even where if you were to take at night a source of white light and you were to take maybe a sheet and just cut a whole bunch of really thin strips in it, you could actually use that as a diffraction grating to um, split light up into its constituent colors, just like a prism would. And it has a lot, there's a lot of benefits to doing it that way. Now in practice, that exercise is super hard to do. And so what you can do is you can just buy a professionally made diffraction grating really, really cheaply. Um, and in fact, they just make really, these really cheap glasses you can buy that have diffraction gratings in them. But it's essentially the same technology. So what happens is almost nobody looks, no astronomer looks through a telescope anymore. Well, I, I shouldn't say that. I don't want to kill the romance of astronomy. But you know, the, the picture of an astronomer looking through a telescope and writing stuff down or something like that, that doesn't really happen anymore. So what happens is that at the focal plane, where the image is coming into focus, uh, the image of whatever the telescope is pointing at is coming into focus, there is something like this grating. We're very tiny. And there, I mean, it, the, the spacing of these uh, slits has to be extremely small, but very tiny slits have been cut in a diffraction grating. And then what happens is that behind that is a bank of CCDs. So it's basically CCDs just like your camera. And in fact, um, the cameras that we have, say, in our cell phones nowadays, a lot of that technology was developed for astronomical reasons. 
because they wanted to have these really um, sensitive cameras that were sensitive across a wide range of wavelengths. So what happens is the diffraction grading splits the light into different colors. It all lands on a CCD and different parts of the CCD catch different colors. And it all gets digitized right away and turns into a digital signal that goes into your computer. And so the scientist almost immediately gets at least some sort of image of intensity, a plot that's intensity as a function of wavelength. And usually that image needs to, that data that needs to be processed to take into account various um, potential bits of distortion caused by the telescope and the machinery, the CCDs and all those kinds of things before we actually see what the object that they're looking at looks like. That's more or less how it works. And in fact, now most people, uh, or many of my colleagues at least, make their observations from their offices. I guess now from their homes, since we don't go to our offices <laughs> right now, but they can make their observations on a telescope that might be in Chile or something like that. They can make their observation from their home. This has been awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Zentner, for uh, taking oh, your time and yeah, sharing your expertise. Um, thank you everybody out there for watching our virtual Cafe Sci. Um, stick with us uh, online with Carnegie Science Center. We'll have more virtual Cafe Sci's and a Women in STEM speaker series um, periodically on Facebook Live. Um, and keep following Dr. Andrew Zentner and his uh, work at the Department of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, Andrew, any last uh, any last words to close out for our Ooh. guests today? Um, I don't know. Just that have fun with science. Science is fun. It's supposed to be fun. You've certainly made it fun for us tonight. So <laughs> thank you so All much right, for great. joining us. Um, uh, and we hope to see you again soon. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Take care, everybody. Have a great night. Yep. Good night.